Today I'm going to talk about the, the cost, which we oftentimes hear uh, uh, spoken about, of discipleship, but also the joy that comes with uh, being a disciple. And I would like to start by talking about a very important person in Celtic spirituality. His name was St. Columba, and uh, there are various stories about why he left Ireland. Uh, but he, he, it was a practice at the time for people who were seeking martyrdom, because this was you know, after the age of the martyrs, maybe it was like you know, 500, um, to get into a boat, a coracle they called them. And there were these big, I mean they weren't big, they were like 20 foot long boats that were made of hide and then were, had water, some kind of waterproofing finish put on them. And they get on the boat, and they would just drift until they got someplace else. And so he and his followers left Ireland and came to the island of Iona, which sometime we'll show some pictures of that. It's just a, it's an incredible place uh, where he founded uh, a monastery. It was the first monastery, uh, a Christian monastery in Scotland. And he was was also a, a incredible model of what it is to be a disciple and what I'd like to do is to read a, a brief quote that someone wrote about him um, a, a guy by the name of Ian Bradley who uh, wrote a uh, biography of uh, Columba said that in many ways this contribution of action and meditation of Columba provided a perfect example of what modern theologians call praxis, which is a combination of involvement in practical issues and theological reflection on them. In the words of a poem written about the, just a, about Columba just a year or two after his death, the poem said, what he conceived keeping vigil by, by action, he ascertained. Now, I, I agree that Columba w- w- uh, was and is a wonderful model of discipleship, of this circle of prayer and practical action. Um, where I would disagree with Ian Bradley is when he talks about praxis, the praxis of, of Columba, being a, com- uh, a combination of involvement in practical issues, which I would agree with, and theological reflection on them, that I would not so much agree with, because the, the, the pattern of prayer that Columba engaged in was a contemplative practice that, through God's grace, transforms us. And I've talked before about this, and the chief intention of uh, this kind of prayer is to move into deeper relationship, deep, deeper intimate relationship with God, and to say yes to God's presence and movement within. So Columba would go away to another small island off of Iona by himself and live in a hut for a few days, a few weeks, sometimes a few months, and then would come back. And the, the practice of life on, on, on the island was singing the daily office because this was just back in the days when there was um, one church but also then spending a great deal of the day in, the, in their own cells and their cells were like they called them beehive huts and that's what they looked, like, it looked like a beehive and each person would live in one of those and these were very small um, monasteries they weren't monasteries in the sense that we think of them they were just these huts, and they might have a, an oratory, you know, uh, which would be where they gathered to, for worship. But there might only be 10 or 12 or 14, 15 people who were a member of, a, of one of these monasteries. And if it got much bigger, they, they'd go and start another monastery. Uh, so it was, it was a... But, but Columba uh, engaged in this, what I would call a, 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 both a praxis of... Um, uh, practical contemplation and practical action. And he showed us how one's life can be transformed by prayer 
and also showed how prayer assists us in our work in our everyday life. It can be very difficult to be doing the things that God calls us to do uh, without stumbling a whole lot. And th- this, this back and forth between prayer and action is something that I personally have found extremely helpful. And I'll talk some more about that when I talk about working some of the, the ministry on, with folks on the margins, um, um, I think maybe next week. So praying in secret is one of the one of the, one of the essences of this enemy, and I mean, it's not just the issue of pridefulness and you know, uh, showing off, but it's but it, it's also a wisdom teaching because when we are alone with God, when we're hanging out with God, continuing to say yes to God's agendas and not our own. And in contemplative prayer, what that means is just being quiet. Then things happen. Things start to happen in our lives. And that's where you know, Christ begins to live more and more in us. And we, as single, egocentric human beings, begin to die. And as we begin to die to our own agendas, to our own idolatries, to our own ways of trying to put, uh, have, have different idols that we worship rather than God, we are healed. And we become freer. Uh, the following Christ is not about bliss, although we sometimes have bliss. It's not about pain, although sometimes we have pain. It's not about visions, although sometimes we have visions. It's, it's deeply about freedom. It's about the it's about the business, it's about the notion, it's about the way of living that we no longer are controlled by the things that have controlled us all of our life. And as I've mentioned before also, the Celtic theological worldview is one where deep and profound goodness is at the heart of every human being. You know, we are made in the image and likeness of God. And at a very deep level, God is always with us and there is goodness at the deepest level of our hearts and souls. These kind of practices help us to strip away the layers that have been created for us because many of the things that happen that have that create the human condition happen before we as little kids can even do much about it. I mean, and so it's not like everything that we do or all of our brokenness has to do with our choices. Some of it has to do with what was done to us. Much of it has to do with that. And I'm not saying we can't make plenty of bad choices, because we sure can. Uh, But what I am saying is that this notion that somehow uh, we're responsible for all of our brokenness, I don't think is is accurate, either psychologically, because um, nor spiritually. So part of the pleasure of being a disciple is we don't have to be that way anymore. We don't have to carry those burdens of brokenness because uh, God gives us, through God's grace, healing as we continue on the spiritual journey. And it will take us unusual places. It will it will open up new friendships. We'll die to some of the, you know some of our old friendships will die. Um, and but what what's what it's deeply about all of it I think 
is that we become people who live the gospel. As a friend of mine says, we we show extraordinary love in everyday lives. And I think that's what we're called to be as human beings. God calls each of us to be the human being that God made us to be. And that human being has got goodness at its heart. And our job is to say yes to God, to allow the movement of the Spirit in our lives to strip away those layers of brokenness and to provide us with the ultimate freedom. And that ultimate freedom is that Christ now lives in me. Amen.